Oh, there's our dear fox. Ah, um, he comes out at this time. Uh, he, he likes the chat. Well, I, I love to chat to foxes, as long as they don't eat me. I'm sitting in the outdoor hut overlooking the medicinal phytology garden with Omar Khalif, curator, poet, writer, excellent humanoid, and we are going to talk viscerally and emotionally about art, activism, nature, the environment, foxes, poetry, bad hair days, good hair days, lockdown. It's great to be sitting here with you at this time. I was just thinking really something about you and words and how we met, because we first met when you were curator at Whitechapel and we worked on an exhibition that I curated called Stamp Out Photography. The title of that kept coming through my mind because it's kind of like a Luddite statement, but it's also relevant to some of the things that I think that you've been thinking about and talking about recently, which is the exaggerated infinitesimal image and um, how we become anxious amongst that. Though I haven't seen you for a while, we did get in touch recently when you posted something on Instagram, which I immediately responded to because it was a word picture, my favourite kind of picture. I say, say, I say to me, I live to say. I applaud your ability to bring humour and poetry to that situation. Yes, I mean, poetry is a saviour in so much as that I think we all write poetry in different ways, whether it's a shopping list or a to-do list, the way that language kind of seeps off the edges of different pages and scraps of paper, all kind of are poetic constructions. And I've always admired that in the work of many who are interested in marginalia, such as yourself, you know, interested in what, what sit in the interstices. You know, I've been sick and tired of the kind of weightedness associated with image culture in the age of COVID, particularly on platforms such as Instagram. And I wanted to hand it over to words. And I wanted to be seen. But I wanted them to stop and look at an image of words as opposed to an image of me. And as someone who has like this constant difficulty with self-representation and through visuality, I felt that words were the best thing to do. And to go back also to this idea of stamping out photography, which was the first project that we worked on together, is that that was about a world, in a sense for me it was, a world where there was a blurring around the photographic image in so much as that we don't know since the advent and the rise of social media uh, what is an image, you know, what are the constituent elements of an image. We used to know that it was on a large format camera and there was a negative and it was printed in, 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 in a dark room and it had a meaning and weight and process. But what does it mean when you strip all of that away from something and you proliferate images and you give literally a camera to every single person because you're giving them a phone now because you want your child and your grandchild and your cousin and your godchild to be safe and you want to be able to contact them. So now you're giving them also an apparatus to film and document and self-document what is the obsession of self-documentation? And it's interesting that you see that project at the Whitechapel Gallery as a curatorial project because I saw it as I curated you to make an artwork out of existing artworks, although mm. the brief originally was to curate something. I think stamp out photography is an artwork that instrumentalizes other works of art to set and pose a series of questions for the viewer. And I think it's a kind of, um, uh, it was an amazing project in that it formally, by looking at the interplay of light with the image, the idea of withholding the image and making the image visible, you were able to create an experience whereby we had to ask, what is the price that I have to pay to see this picture? And a picture should never be free. Wow. That exhibition was kind of unusual 
as in I had chosen a selection of other people's works and then suspended them in another work, which was this series of CMYK lights, one of which, K, is dark, so the lights went out. And in different lights, different colourways came out in the images. And even looking at the images live and in real time and space, one was intimately connected with the idea of their reprinting or reproduction. When we met here at the Nature Reserve today, we stood in front of a recent billboard painting that I made that started off as a word poem and ended up as a phrase or statement or suggestion, proposition, fact. And it reads, the retrospective has been cancelled. That originally was going to be the title of an exhibition that I would have been doing now, but the title was conjured up or came into my mind well pre-Covid. Ideas of hierarchies and absurdities around mythologizing and, and packaging and exhibition making and the sort of patriarchies embedded in all of that were in my mind when that statement came into my head and I found it humorous but I guess it does connect us up directly with something that happened with you recently in that you had an exhibition open in Sharjah right at the beginning of this Covid debacle and the title of that exhibition is Art in the Age of Anxiety. So in my mind when I read that I made a sort of intuitive connection, I mean not actually a, a verbalised or literalised one, but an intuitive connection with Walter Benjamin and his essay Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. And I'm sure that was there for you, I don't know how literally or tangentially, probably both, but as you were talking about this proliferation of images that are stripped back of context and limit, it made me think of this idea of aura. And what does that mean today, Benjamin's idea that a reproduction of a piece of art could be amazing in very many ways, but it could never have the aura of the original? I mean, you've touched upon so many different elements that basically form or constitute the entirety of my practice as a curator. Uh, Benjamin is someone that I return to probably on a daily basis. I read oh. Benjamin. I, I very much am interested in this concept of the aura because really, how do we start to talk about the aura when a lot of the media that we start to see, whether it be video art or photography is in itself something that is reproducible. But my argument is that it's not so much about the mechanism through which the object has been created, but also the context through which it is and is presented. And this is the job of a curator. So the exhibition that you mentioned, Art in the Age of Anxiety, which does require some more context, but before I go into that, it was created to mirror what it would feel like if you were shot down a fiber optic cable and you were wading your way through tunnels. The architect and I, we talked about, you know, bath houses. We talked about the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and we really created moments, moments where the kind of paint that was chosen for one wall, whether it was reflective or silk or not, would reflect the image from one wall to the floor that would draw you here and there to create a journey. Because I think that as a curator, and indeed as artists, we are storytellers. And so the aura for me lies in the ability for the human being or the entity, the fox, you know, whatever it is, to experience the journey. Yet, unfortunately, what we saw in this kind of moment uh, of COVID was the proliferation of also museums and virtual viewing rooms and everything going online and Google map style viewings of spaces and people talking about how wonderful they were, but they were not wonderful because they felt banal. And so I do think that there are limits to what can be reproduced, but the thing about the internet as a space 
Because the internet is many things. It is a space, but it is also a thing. It is also a kind of consciousness. And the, the, the thing about it as a space is that there have to be things that are indigenous to that, the same way that these plants here are indigenous to this space. If something is not native to that and made for the space of the internet, it will fall flat on its face and it will not have any oratic function. We will not be able to feel what Benjamin calls the intensity of the moment. Do you feel that there is a misunderstanding about that in the here and now? There's so much of virtuality in terms of how art is presented at the most. I mean, the word virtual more or less translates as almost. Mm. It's not the thing. But do you feel there is a misunderstanding in virtuality between what the art is and what the representation of the art is. Absolutely. I mean, think of this uh, genre of virtual reality art that has emerged. You know, we see many artists who are working with it now, from Sao Fei to Marina Abramovich to Ai Weiwei. And the whole thing for me is fascinating because I love to see what the possibilities of technologies can do, what they can engender, what kinds of creative limits they might unpack or open, but at the end of the day, virtual reality is simply about creating something that could exist in the physical gallery that maybe you don't have the space to do, and people assume that these technologies are the future, but they actually are the past. This notion of three-dimensionality of screen technology is not new. And so the frustration is, the obsession with the new, i.e. this kind of contortion of the fact that, oh, well, the good thing about COVID is that now we're exploring the digital sphere and so giving credence to these technologies which haven't been given space before. That isn't true. I looked up the word aura today and I've been looking up the etymology of words a lot recently. I think I'm doing it because I've found words being misrepresented and misused a lot recently and maybe I myself have lost count or lost connection with the meaning of words so I've sought to look backwards and try and re-excavate or re-understand where words come from. Quite simply aura is, comes from the word breath and breeze leading to something very corporal but also something very spatial which does connect with what you're saying it's about a physical relationship and a corporal and spatial relationship with somebody something yeah, yeah and i think the notion of the corporal is what's been lost in the age of covid and in so much as this idea of isolation is not something that we as humans are born to experience this distanciation, which is actually a term used in relation to melodrama and cinema, and particularly the work of Douglas Sirk, but there's this wall in between you and people that emerges where when you start to encounter them again, it's almost like you're performing or you don't know how to perform. You don't trust your emotions. The notion of phenomenology, the notion of, of tactility, that is intrinsically human. To take that away from someone is one of the most horrible things that you can do. And it may not seem to the stiff upper lip British person as such a big deal, but it does matter even though you don't realize. You might not realize how many people in your life you hug on a regular basis, how many people you share a meal with without realizing it until it's all gone. And so one of the things that, you know, also talking about the subject of the aura and the body and the breath, it's really about life. And I have questioned the idea of life a lot this year. This idea of living, is something that is in some degrees a construct but in many degrees it's like breathing we don't think about it as a thing and we know now that the way that we treat nature as humans if the wildfires and the hurricanes the wars that have occurred in tandem to this virus are anything to go by this may be the first of many viruses that could be even worse so how do we start to constitute ourselves and how do we start to think about ourselves? And I really went through, returned to a very depressive state. And the way that I worked my way through that depressive state was to read and to research and to try and understand. 
it's very hard because people are depressed. They actually are depressed because of their isolation, but they don't want to sign something that says, I am depressed. They struggle to admit that because it's so stigmatized. And yeah. that is something that I felt the exhibition that I did also try to de deconstruct, but also, you know, it's what I'm trying to do now of my own life. Yeah. I no longer want to hide yeah. the fact that I am human. Amazing to hear you speak so openly and so powerfully about that, Omar, and I think you're absolutely right. There is a big issue around language and stigma. There's actually quite a lot of research going on here around medicinal plants and mental health and spending time in nature and mental health. This space is a sort of gap. It is a place where you can be that is not anything in particular. And there's something about the need for space amongst all the imagery, amongst all the noise, amongst all the pressure and anxiety, where you can just not quite do anything. I quite often come down here and I get here, I think, great, I'm going to go to phytology and do this or do that, or hang out, do nothing, and I get here and I can't really handle it because I'm wound up for something else. So it, it, there's a very different kind of space for questioning here. I wanted to pick up on something that came to my head while you were talking, because obviously you are known as a curator who contemplates ourselves, you know, how we are suspended in the digital world, how we exist within that, how we express within that, how we communicate within that. Obviously a lot of the work that you discuss and write about and curate is digital work that people would not think of as being the obvious work that emits or, uh, or creates sensuous or spatial pleasure in the conventional sense. The work that I actually am interested in and write about most is work that is actually critical of the context of the digital, yeah. i.e. whether it's you know art that is decoding algorithmic culture and then thinking about how machines visualize the world, or whether it's about a kind of mockery through action of the fact that many people are living lives in virtual gaming environments that instead of interacting with each other or the fact that people create and construct their entire identities on social media. And so when I think about that work in terms of how to present it, I'm more interested in writing about it, to be honest, than actually showing it. But when I show it, I always think, does this need to be in a gallery? And if it doesn't, I will not show it because it needs to be able to create an experience. But one of the things that is very interesting is that you talked about this idea of a kind of it's almost accelerated headspace mm -hmm. that you're in that has to do with the urban environment that when you come here to this reserve it's like a challenge or a questioning mm -hmm. space to ask you to stop mm -hmm. but I would suggest the urban landscape has completely shifted over the last 20 years mm -hmm. of your life in so much as that it is cross embedded with screens. Everywhere you walk, there's a Wi Fi network. Everywhere you go, you're getting notifications and alerts. There's these phones are cross embedded media, which is something that Norman M. Klein talked about in around 2010. And so your entire body, it no longer is yours. It's a kind of spectral thing in that even when you don't have your phone on you, you could be in the shower and you'll have that spectral vibration of the missing appendage and the phone isn't there and it hasn't rung. But what it does to your cognitive senses and, and abilities and, and machinations is that you are always wired on, which means that more than ever, we need nature but we need physicality and being or else we will descend in my opinion into a world whereby we are so ramped up that we will explode into alcohol and drug induced comas because we'll need to numb that somehow because how do you carry on forever like that it's unbearable 
there is a lot of talk about, okay, well, a lot of people work from home and, you know, maybe that's a good thing and we could save office and building costs and, you know, we'll save money and it'll be better for the environment because people won't be taking as many cars or not as many carbon emissions will be emitted into the world. But that is totally bullshit because the reality is, is the internet is a thing. It is a physical thing. They are data centers that hold our information that literally exist in countries like, you know, the UAE where I live uh, most of the time. They are advertising that Google is building a massive data center. But what happens when you need data centers and there is no earth? You will start knocking down social housing question mark or will you start going into countries like India, like sub-Saharan Africa and give not a toss about the local community and build your data centers yeah. and what about the fiber optic cables that link us all these need to go underground you need to dig holes these are physical things yeah. people seem to think of the internet as this metaphor of the cloud mm. which is mm. not true the yeah. internet is a physical object yeah I think we need to download that and wise up to the fact that even just keeping up these data centers is having a massive impact on climate change, cooling and energy usage alone is phenomenal. I guess as I've been spending time here in this garden space that feels very separate, I've cautioned myself against forgetting about technology and forgetting how things do get shared. Having these podcasts is important to me because I think the viscerality of conversation and voice is important at the moment. There's a lot in what you said, but as I've been talking recently about ecology and I've been working more as an activist and thinking about this very space actually as a piece of gradual and ongoing activism also, I also want to remind myself that we do to all exist in this world of digital communication because it's kind of easy to sort of suggest that that isn't the case. I've been thinking about how nature works in the digital age. I was talking to somebody here the other day about soil and she said that ancient forest beds are referred to as the world wide wood mm. because the amount of messaging that goes on between the plants through the fungi and spores and ancient root networks is phenomenal. We don't see that, we don't hear it. It isn't our language. Technologies and the internet and all its attendant constituent elements and functions are as layered and textured as that and we are complicit in all of it so we should decode, we should pull back, we should understand the code or the algorithm or who owns what or how something is made or how it is stored or how it is decoded but also we should remember generally as humans is that we cannot exist in a perfect world whereby we don't make or use things that may somehow on a subconscious level ethically go against some of our needs. It's like even if you hate McDonald's as a corporation but you're really craving it and you want it, you are not suddenly evil because you have had a Big Mac. So the idea of consciousness is very yeah. important and consciousness seems to be lost in the virtual sphere because you just kind of are in an endless stream that is embodying every part of you. It is also a great thing, but we need to be able to understand that everything in this world, now more than ever, is tied to power. Yeah. And power is not in our hands. Recalling the work of Cambridge Analytica mm. and Facebook and the effect that that had on the American election. election, we need to be able to decode and understand how and where the power is moving. Zuckerberg's power is extraordinary, not only his wealth. These guys are the overlords of our era and what 
amazes me is that we submit and buy into it. Instagram has free copyright to use and reproduce any image that anybody posts on Instagram at will. So we are also almost willingly stupefied by it. That's something that I'm grappling with at the moment around climate change also is in the full face of knowledge how we continue to behave in a way that is bad for our society and our earth. The power of language is something that I think we have because we can produce so much of it as well on these platforms that we aren't aware and that's why I thought your recent project where you gave this giant full stop to our Minister of State for the Environment, not only to critique what's happening to the waters and then around Britain and illegal fishing, but to really say, language has meaning, language has power, I'm putting a full stop to it, I felt was a totally Benjaminian act in that it was not about putting the full stop in an email. What power does the full stop in an email have? But a 1.5 ton full stop in front of your office? That means a lot. Because you have to move that shit. What you're saying is around the viscerality of language and when language becomes so substantially slippery that its content is really hard to decipher or hold or respect, I find that I need to move forward in a visceral way with language and it becomes a physical thing for me at that point because I actually start to feel incredibly physically disenfranchised but also motivated at the same time to respond to that situation. I started to think about it as I was carving it because it was made from this intensely strong resistance granite which as it turns out was millions of years old. I started to engage with the idea of maybe this was a sort of container for language or a tomb for language or a depth charge of language unsaid or unspoken or waiting to happen. Maybe it was the end of language as I understand it or as I have liked to understand it and to illegally deposit something like that onto government property is also a very physical and performative, highly orchestrated theatrical act. So the sort of theatre of the gesture is not detached from the object. So I'm rethinking how I'd negotiate my language and, and my work and my kind of materiality and immat immateriality in the context of now. And I have been thinking about that for some time, possibly for always, but it's now reached a hiatus because somehow Covid has laid bare or exaggerated and made super visible the strange rituals and the hierarchies of our major institutions and they don't feel like empowering places for art at this moment in time. A question for you to follow up actually is, do you feel an urgency to create anymore because I can't imagine the pressure and tension that one must feel now about the privilege to even produce work. Mm. I think that's always under question. For me, at the moment, I would say, yet again, I don't know what it is to make work and I don't know what the best site for my work is or what the site for work is and that I do find quite a motivating and inspiring conundrum and it's led me to sitting in this 
strange shed with garden tools in it that's kind of the opposite to a rarefied art space yet is if you want it to be an art space it's certainly a thinking space and a, a happening space I suppose I have started really to think about my work as happenings and citing them quite specifically and also enjoying somehow when I can some casualness around that so I have enjoyed making these one-off publications that have been in the form of receipts that I've left here hanging out in the elements and then found that the foxes have mauled and taken into their layers and to engage with the vulnerability that we feel. It is very difficult as a cultural worker i.e. a person who is meant to craft the narrative to decide who will tell the stories, who will make the work. It's very hard to work anymore because yeah. we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, my show Art in the Age of Anxiety did open in the summer. It was meant to open in March before lockdown. It closed for three months and it was a very gruelling build and I was told, but well, you don't know if we we're going to open it. And before that, I had a show at the Royal College of Art that I was very excited about closed one day before it was meant to open mm. and that was two shows back to back mm. and then a book project was dropped and then my catalogue or publication tied to my show Art in the Age of Anxiety is still at the printers now it's going to come out probably I don't know when at the time it looked like it wasn't going to happen how incredibly prescient that your exhibition was called Art in the Age of Anxiety before we were all in this unique situation which has become so strange to each of us. I am very excited that your book is being printed. It feels to me, having read many of the essays, to be an important if not necessary book and I was struck by something that one of the writers said in your book that in this case, solidarity, the act of joining together and being together means being apart because it means isolation. And it's a very peculiar time when actually caring for each other and having empathy for each other means remaining apart and separate. I mean, that's the greatest sadness of all. I think you're referring to Professor W.J.T. Mitchells. I don't necessarily agree with his statement. I really don't want to think about solidarity in relation to a virus. I do not and will not believe that a disease is cause for solidarity. Rather, I believe that relationships to people whose values you share mm. are calls for mm. solidarity. And that is what is important mm -hmm. here. It's recognizing that we are human, recognizing that we need to be together, mm -hmm. and it is not about being alone. These obstacles and challenges have led you into incredible journeys of the mind and the pen, mm -hmm. and you are leading a life where you are facing them head on at the same time as having to react to them. Mm. And chapeau. Merci. Oh, there's our dear fox. Ah, um, he comes out at this time. Uh, he, he likes to chat. Oh, I, I love to chat to foxes, as long as they don't eat me. Mm -hmm. I say. I've recorded on my phone now since. The Squirrel's Heartbeat is hosted by me, Fiona Banner, aka The Vanity Press, and was made in collaboration with Michael Smythe of Nomad Projects. All of these conversations were recorded at the Bethnal Green Nature Reserve in East London. Production Alice Walters, audio production and sound design by Lucia Skazokio from Social Broadcasts, and video production by Joseph Sikorsky.
This series is supported by the Arts Council England and the Bethnal Green Nature Reserve Trust.